So this is an interesting case. This one is a diaphragmatic hernia, but look at that. There are all these post-op, post-traumatic changes in the pelvis. This patient had had a car wreck months before, and this diaphragmatic hernia was delayed. It, it, she probably had a diaphragmatic defect that persisted from that car wreck, but ultimately uh, just developed it months later. And you can see her stomach up through there. You can see the diaphragm defect, the free edge of the torn left hemidiaphragm right there. And so the radiologist was simply fooled by that, uh, that this was deemed chronic, thought it must be chronic. Abdominal cramping pain times one day but it was read as an elevation of the left hemidiaphragm with no acute finding. So actually the radiologist did not note that the diaphragm didn't go up over that uh, gastric fundus, right? They thought that that uh, was just an elevated hemidiaphragm. So nine out of 10 for not using structured reporting. Presented to the ER with postcoital neck pain. So it might've been that. Uh, the CT was interpreted as left hemidiaphragm elevation. The final report was read as a large left diaphragmatic hernia, but there is no record of communication. So again, that phenomenon we described earlier. The patient returned to the ER by ambulance with abdominal pain. CT demonstrated a large hernia with stranding. Concerns regarding aortitis and pancreatitis delayed surgery at which a, ga a gangrenous gastric fundus was discovered. So initial demand of 275, estimated verdict of 750, chance of success 40, and apportioned liability 60. So we got out of this one with an indemnity of 250,000. So not terrible. The question of causation was raised. Was our misread really the one that uh, set events in motion. That's essentially the question they're asking with causation. So that's a tough, uh, that's a tough one. And you could tell in reading, I read the final report on this and they just said uh, of uncertain duration, right? And there were no real ischemic changes to that herniated gastric fundus. It wasn't thick walled, it wasn't stranded, et cetera, when this final was issued. And so they just didn't put the, uh, the right emphasis on that. I think that looks really tight around the body of the stomach there where it's coming up through that defect. And you might at least suggest the potential for obstruction to develop. All right, so our estimated settlement, sorry about that, was 350. And so we got out for an indemnity of 250. <clears throat> Institutions have the most insurance coverage. I would expect plaintiff to include corporate negligence claims that the overall process of reporting or review of the radiology reports was intrinsically flawed in some way. And that does happen, and this uh, relates to a uh, deep pockets question we got recently. They do come after the institutions that they suspect will have uh, higher insurance uh, limits. And so that is a, a real thing. I was asked earlier, you know, should we uh, go with the higher limit on the policy or the lower one, will that entice people to come after me if I have a higher limit on my policy? Generally speaking with individuals, we have not seen that's the case with the exception of those cases where people are uh, settling out of a suit and the, the smaller the number of people they can come after, the more they're focused on who's got the highest limit. That does seem to be a real thing. Uh, from our standpoint, we self-insure, and so we don't really have the same uh, policy limit issues that, uh, that individuals might. Uh, we actually self-insure, and then we have an adjunctive policy for anything above a certain level. Yeah, sorry. I've always wondered in, in the depositions and stuff, it sounds like all the attorneys know your insurance limits. That's they do. Disclosed. Yeah, they typically do. Yeah. Oh, uh, the question was, do the lawyers actually know your insurance limits? And yes, that is disclosed information. 
All right. Uh, the last comment here I thought was interesting. Luzerne County is much more favorable location to try cases than, say, Philadelphia, which is the worst. Uh, the anticipated jury panel is somewhat conservative and tends to be older. You know what they say about Pennsylvania, right? You've got Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Alabama in the middle. Uh, that's how they always describe it. Um, but that, that is a comment that I saw more than once. Uh, people are pretty scared of trying cases in Philadelphia because that wasn't an offhand, uh, uninformed comment. It does appear to be just about ground zero for MedMau. All right, this is a fascinating case. And I will tell you, uh, when I went through everything, I was really looking at things to defend our efforts at workflow improvement. And so I was, uh, I made sure I knew were comparisons available, were coronal and sagittal reformats always available, you know, the sort of operational things that radiologists are always very nervous about, right? I can't read this without a prior, I'm gonna get sued. Actually, not really true. That, that stuff did not tend to factor in very frequently at all, except in this case, perhaps in this case. Uh, comparisons were important, as were the coronal and sagittal reformats. So, was, I mean, are you seeing anything here? I would never have called anything on the axials. So when we go to the coronals, you can see the prior on the left, and the current on the right. So this is a non-contrast scan for a stent evaluation, not really the best study, of course, and it might have made the radiologist a little less mentally alert, right? You might think, oh, what am I gonna be able to say about this stent? It's a non-contrast study. But look at that follow-up study on the right. I mean, it's just, it's kinked, it's broken, it looks to be occluded. So again, uh, the coronals and the priors, I think, factored in here. And this is the one case where I'd say that that was absolutely critical. And we even put the disclaimer in. The stent graft is incompletely evaluated due to the lack of intravenous contrast. Again, I didn't find disclaimers or directives to perform clinical correlation to be very helpful uh, in any of these defense cases. And they called it a stable appearance of an aortic aneurysm and stent graft. And I can only assume that means they didn't look at the coronals, right? Because it would be hard to look at those coronals and, uh, and still call that stable. All right, so that one got a nine out of 10, dinged only for structured reporting. And this one was a long time course. Um, this patient had multiple AP CTs for stent graft surveillance. They were all done without contrast due to the patient's severe allergy. So that had become the standard for this patient. His most recent one had been a CT in September compared to a June one. And he actually went months after that last CT before he presented with a problem, which strikes me as incredible. He walked around with that kinked broken stent for quite some time but finally came in with severe abdominal pain and died of hypotension and pulseless electrical activity before really any evaluation could be done. So this came in at 750 to a million as an estimated verdict, chance of success 55 to 60, apportioned liability was 40 to 50%, and the estimated settlement five to 750, and we got out for an indemnity of $250,000. The vascular surgery expert was very critical of radiologist testimony. Radiologist testimony on matters concerning vascular in imaging was woefully inadequate and demonstrated that even though he is qualified on paper, in actuality, he lacks even basic knowledge about vascular imaging. Uh, the expert characterized radiologist testimony as embarrassing. Well, that is a vascular surgeon's comment and uh, but it does, it does bring up the issue, right? That there's a lot you can't undo when you're in a med mal case. Certainly don't go back and write in the chart. In fact, don't even go back and look at the images, right? Certainly don't try to amend your report uh, or do any of those sorts of things. But you know what? It's not illegal to read up a little before you go into your deposition. Find out, for instance, what is a Peterson hernia, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it is not 
uh, frowned upon and no one will do anything about it. Uh, and certainly that is what I would do is I would crack some books and read up on the stuff, right? You would probably want to go through all your categorizations of stent uh, leaks and complications and, and those sorts of things. So I think that is a, a useful tip. Uh, the vascular surgeon presented as a credible witness overall and an ob with an obvious depth of understanding. And uh, it sounds to me like he was an arrogant pontificator, but sometimes that does carry the day. Along that same line, those stents are not actually broken. They're put in as modules. Oh, so they're just shifted. So yeah. Right. Absolutely true. Yep. No, I actually knew that was the case. Sorry to misspeak. I will say in my defense, I have never put one in. <laughs> in fact, I'll go further. It has been 16 years since I held a needle. <laughs> And that time was uh, in an airplane, actually, for a guy that needed an IV. So. <laughs> All right, this next one is just a very straightforward case of bowel perforation. It's just a missed free air, free gas in the peritoneum, a, uh, a small incisional hernia. But that is worth noting right there. A little bit of thickened bowel wall and a little bit of free gas. And that was all there was to go by. But we've got the statement right there, no free air. This one got an eight out of 10. Oh, I highlighted the um, typo there. That's actually real. And you know, it's funny, but I did see one instance where a typographical kind of worried people. And it was that one that I described to you before where uh, it was the Nevada case where we called in appendicitis, but there was a second line in the impression that said renal cell carcinoma. There was a typo in that line. And the defense attorneys were nervous about going to court with that uh, because it showed an inattention and a potentially uh, misconstrued report right, that perhaps even that ER physician would point at it and say, well, I couldn't make sense of that line because of that typo. And I thought it said, don't worry about renal cell carcinoma, right? So uh, it is interesting that there was at least that one case where that was uh, potentially an issue. All right, so this patient came in at 6 p.m. CT was interpreted as normal discharged with a diagnosis of influenza and came back about a day later uh, and had free intraperitoneal gas. The patient developed sepsis and multi-organ failure. He is now wheelchair bound, blind in one eye, has trouble communicating and has right upper extremity hemiplegia. ICU stays are rarely kind to people. So the estimated verdict was 2.5 million, chance of success 60, a portion liability 40 and an estimated verdict of 750. And this patient being a young 47 uh, actually got a high indemnity of 1.8 million. Uh, the opposing counsel was capable and competent. And so that might have had uh, some, that might have made some contribution to that large indemnity. Uh, and the ER physician, you know, as so often they do, and I don't think unreasonably, uh, said he did all the right tests and relied on the results. 